Okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone back to another YKG seminar. Today, it's a great pleasure to have Samuel La Liberté from McGill University as a speaker. Samuel did his master studies from 2018 to 2020 at McGill University and continued then there as a PhD student of Robert Brandenburger. His research focuses on cosmic strings, emergent cosmology, matrix models, and related topics. And today we will learn more from Samuel about the IKKT model mentioned already in the last talk by Robert Brandenburger last month. And uh, we'll hear about its relation to emergent cosmology. So thank you very much, Samuel, for accepting our invitation and for being here today. And yeah, please feel free to start whenever you're ready. All right, uh, thank you, Tobias. Can you hear me? Last check before we go into the Hauer talk. Yes, yes, Okay. Uh, cool. we can hear you well. All right, well, thank you, Tobias, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to give uh, this talk for students uh, at the Young Researchers of Quantum Gravity. Uh, like you mentioned, Tobias, I will give uh, a presentation on the topic, which is sensibly similar to what Robert talked about last week, which is matrix cosmology. However, I will take another emphasis. Um, Robert talked about a lot about um, uh, structure formation and uh, why it is important in inflation, for example, and uh, how you can obtain it from matrix theory and string gas cosmology. In my case, I will not talk about structure formation at all. And instead, I will focus on um, the time evolution of space uh, near the initial singularity. Or more precisely, what I will try to do is come out with the formalism in the IKKT model, which is a non perturbative description of, of string theory, uh, a formalism in which uh, maybe we can invade this, evade this singularity and obtain solutions uh, at the early universe, which you would not be able to obtain normally through general relativity. So that will be the last part of the talk. Uh, in passing, I will do a little review of the IKKT model, and I will do a little summary of uh, cosmology. Uh, but I don't expect all in all this talk to be very long. So if you have any questions, please let me know, and uh, I will answer. Um, so without further ado, let's begin with the talk. If I can change slides. OK, good. So before we get to the fun stuff, let's let us see why it is important that we might consider string cosmology or matrix cosmology in our case to describe the real universe. Uh, let us remind ourselves that uh, stand Big Bang cosmology has many successes. If we look further in space, then we see that distant gal galaxies are red shifted. This indicates that uh, the universe is expanding. If we go further back in time, uh, what we see is called the CMB, which is the period at which, uh, well, um, photons finally decouple from the original plasma and we can see something. So that's also a prediction from the, the standard belt model of cosmology, which has been observed and measured with great success. And uh, according to Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, there's a correct amount of light elements that are predicted from the early universe. So that's nice. In fact, this model is so nice that we can accurately predicts, well, most of the effect that happens in the universe up to 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang today, which is about the energy scale that we get from the DLHC. So that's pretty nice, but standard Big, standard Big Bang cosmology also has is issues. Next slide. Okay. It also has its issues. Like for example, if you take the past light cone from now to recombination and the forward light cone from uh, the Big Bang to recombination, you will notice that the forward light cone after the Big Bang is much smaller at the time of recombination than the, forward, than the, the past light cone uh, from now. And this means that causality alone cannot explain why our universe is so homogeneous. Um, for that to be the case, this past, this future light cone from the Big Bang should be much either lo as large as the past light cone up to recombination or larger. Um, so that's an issue. 
there's also something called the flatness problem. If you look at this flatness parameter, which should be zero, so the, the density minus one should be zero for a flat universe, then you notice that um, this quantity increases, it diverges as uh, the temperature decreases our universe. And that means that for universe to be as flat as we observe it today, uh, it had to be initially extremely flat, uh, which requires a severe fine tuning. That's what people call the flatness problem. And then finally, the problem which I'm gonna be focusing on most today, uh, the singularity problem, is the idea that um, as you go back towards the Big Bang, uh, density, the density uh, of matter in the universe diverges, which introduces a curvature singularity. And this is problematic because it breaks our approximation that GR should be valid at early time. So we should add something to resolve this problem. The common paradigm, well, the, the paradigm, uh, the solution that people usually towards, turn towards to, to solve these problems is called inflation. Uh, and the idea behind inflation is as follows. Uh, we will assume that uh, somewhere in the early universe, there has been a phase of exponential expansion, which lies to the finite time. And that phase of um, exponential expansion is usually modeled in terms of a rolling scalar field of potential here. So here you would have a model of gravity where I add uh, an inflaton field, which is described by the action that you see uh, on the slide. And a potential which is uh, which has the form that you can see in the figure on the left. So what would happen is that the, the, the field configuration of the inflaton, which is the particle which is associated to this field here, uh, will start at a region of the potential which is reasonably flat, uh, which will allow uh, what's called the slow roll conditions to be satisfied. And when the slow roll uh, so conditions are satisfied, this equation of space parameter that you see here is about minus one, which corresponds to dark energy, approximately minus one. And this will lead to a period of exponential inflation, as I told before, which will end once uh, the scalar field rolls down far enough that these approximations are broken down, uh, in which case it will roll down the end part of this potential, oscillate and stabilize right, in a period called reheating. And then uh, the period of radiation dominated cosmology will follow, hopefully without any of the problems I've mentioned. In fact, this is what happens if inflation lasts sufficiently long. Uh, for example, what, what will happen during this period of inflation is that uh, the forward light cone from the Big Bang will be stretched exponentially. And uh, if this stretching lasts for more than 60 epochs of inflation, so here this quantity TH must be either as equal or uh, greater than 60, then the past light cone, well, the forward light cone from the Big Bang will become uh, much greater or as great, great or as greater as uh, the past light cone from them. And then the horizon problem solved. Moreover, during inflation, uh, this uh, flatness parameter that, that I've um, explained before, well, it decreases exponentially to zero. So the universe becomes exponentially flat as the universe expands during this uh, period of, uh, of inflation. And hence, if this period of exp uh, ex uh, inflation lasts sufficiently long, then this problem is solved at the end of inflation. So that's pretty neat. Um, however, inflation is not free of problems. Uh, if it is the correct theory to describe our universe, it should be consistent with gravity, or in other words, string uh, theory. However, in recent years, it's been shown that um, inflation struggles to achieve this uh, in light of this problem of this program called uh, the Small Plan Program. The idea behind this Small Plan Program is that uh, there is a, a finite number of vacuum of a string theory that's called the, the landscape, which is very large. However, there is an even larger region of effective field theory, which are inconsistent with string theory. And those are called, uh, those are said to be part of what's called the swamp land. 
And in, within the past 20 years, there's been many conjectures that have been made that these effective field theories have to follow in order to be um, consistent with string theory. Um, and if they don't, then they are said to be part of the swampland. And if they are, then they are said to be uh, a valid landscape of string theory. And in recent years, there's been conjectures that have been uh, putting inflation uh, in hot waters. There's this first one called the uh, refined disorder conjecture which has been conjectured based on observation of vacuas in string theory. By, observe, by studying vacuas, you can see that most of them have a potential which has a grain that is greater than C times V. And it also has been motivated by entropy argument. And uh, this poses trouble for inflation because as we've seen in the past slide, you need a region which is very flat in order for inflation to happen in the potential. And uh, this constraint ma makes it so that this potential, this flat region would be very unnatural in string theory. Uh, and hence, it's very hard to realize inflation uh, given this constraint. And then there's another conjecture which Robert talked in intensively about uh, last week, which is called the transplanted censorship conjecture. And the idea behind this conjecture is that um, during inflation, subplankton quantum fluctuations should remain quantum. So sh they should not uh, be visible in your effective field theory. And for that to happen, then um, inflation should last less than this time scale, which depends on the other scale. It should be less than uh, h to the minus one times log to the minus one. And that severely constrains the duration of, of inflation and makes it hard to make it last long enough. So that it's all these problems as Robert has mentioned before in his talk. So inflation is hard to build in string theory. And furthermore, I have not mentioned this, but if you noticed before, I haven't talked about the singularity for a moment. And this is also something that uh, inflation struggles with. Uh, see, if you have a short-lived uh, period of inflation that happened after the Big Bang, then the Big Bang remains. This period of radiation dominated the cosmology before inflation still has a singularity. So you don't solve the singularity problem. And you could say, for example, hey, do I, if, what if I have a um, period of internal inflation, which should be ruled out based on the conjecture that I, I showed before, the translation censorship conjecture. But what if it remains? Uh, then some authors have shown that a singularity still persists because the uh, this initial value problem inflation is not well um, is not well posed. And furthermore, well, I've told you that string theory uh, is a well, if it is a complete theory of nature, then it should be able to explain this singularity, right? But in fact, it's quite hard because if you take a, a typical string theory, well, it has what's called alpha prime corrections, which uh, depend on higher curvature invariance. And if you go towards the Big Bang, suppose you take a particular cosmological solution of this, um, of this action, and you go towards the Big Bang, what will happen is that once, the, once time reaches the string scale, which is square root of lambda prime here, uh, then these curvature invariants cannot be neglected. And this leads to uh, an infinite tower. You, you, and now you need to consider an infinite tower of corrections uh, to your equation of motion. So all in all, uh, big bang stuff in string theory is very hard to study uh, because of these corrections and because also of the time dependence of these solutions. In passing, I will also mention that there is alternative to inflation. Uh, however, they, they also suffer from different uh, pathologies. Well, I wouldn't say pathologies, but they require very exotic stuff to be realized or non-perturbative effects. For example, bouncing cosmologies uh, can also solve these problems that I mentioned. These bouncing cosmologies are based on the idea that there is an, a period of contraction before uh, the universe re-expands. Uh, near the Big Bang, and uh, and also that the scale factor does not reach zero in a way to evade the, the curvature singularity. So this would be, for example, the pre-Big Bang scenario and string theory or the periodic scenario. However, to realize this bounce, you need uh, quite exotic matter or non-perturbative effects, such as, for example, an S-brain 
in string theory. So here again, here, those are scenarios that are not always fully described by effective field theories. So you need non-participant effective. And then there's another type of scenario, which is called emergent cosmology, which um, Robert has discussed in great detail last time, in which the scale factor stays uh, very close to zero at early times. There's a latent phase, and then there's a transition to uh, radiation dynamic cosmology. Uh, this would be scenarios like, for example, string gas cosmology or the matrix scenario, uh, theory scenario that he explained last time. Uh, however, uh, these scenarios are hard to study because we don't know the time evolution of the universe uh, near this latent phase. But near this latent phase, we, uh, for example, in string gas cosmology, would, we would expect um, gravity to be described by some kind of UV completion of, of gravity that I've described before, where the, you have this tower of correction. So here, this is a, it's really an assumption that we're making that there's this latent phase, which is based on the thermodynamics of strings. Um, and we still have to yeah, uh, find what the time evolution of this phase is. So all in all, we've seen that uh, a standard began has some issues. Uh, I will put emphasis on the singularity problem, which is what I wanted to, to address today. And we, we've seen also that effective field theories uh, such as inflation, for example, uh, can solve these issues. However, they, they, there's some consistency issues with quantum gravity. And also that, that might also mean that we have to consider non-perturbative effects. And alternative, al alternatives to inflation also show that we need non-perturbative effects. So all in all, it seems that in order to explain the early universe, we would need some non-perturbative theory of uh, string theory. Um, and those theories of the exist, uh, they have been uh, postulated in terms of matrix model, and this is what I want to explore next. The model we'll be focusing on today is called the IKKT model. Um, and this model uh, is supposed to be a description, a non perturbative description of type 2B string theory in 10 dimensions. This model is as no free parameters, is fully described in terms of matrices which describes some kind of target space, uh, some kind of space-time target space. So here, uh, the IKKT model action is as follows on the screen. Uh, it has 10 matrices, uh, which describe each direction or space. For example, these matrices are contracted uh, with respect to the Minkowski matrix, the Minkowski flat matrix. So this model has lots of invariants. And this means that, for example, this A0 component of the matrices would describe some information about time. And the AI matrices along the nine spatial dimension would describe some information about space. And this model also has target space fermions, uh, which make it uh, super symmetric. Since it is, uh, it's supposed to describe type 2B string theory. And in fact, it can be derived from type 2B string theory. Uh, in order to do that, what you do is that you, you start with what's called the shield action which is just another form of the non logo action, like the Polyakov action. If I vary this action and I plot the equation of motion back in, then I actually recover uh, the non logo action. So this is just an equation of motion for the type 2B string. If I take this shield action, well, I'll first observe that there's uh, quantities here that are Poisson brackets. Um, and if I uh, replace these Poisson brackets by commutators and the integral by trace, then I obtain exactly the IKKT action, which I obtained before. So the IKKT action is more or less a description of the target space of a string in type 2B string theory. And since it's a theory of string, it also has string solution. Um, take, for example, the shield action that I had before. If I impose that this commutator, uh, the xm uh, xm is equal to zero, which satisfies the equation of motion. Then uh, the configuration of space that satisfies the equation of motion is just that of a long string. So a zero x zero he would just be a time parameter, and then if the string extends in the a one direction, then it would be described by some kind of sigma parameter. So this two parameter surface would be des would describe a long string which just propagate forwards in space-time. 
Uh, and by analogy, replacing all of these by commutators, all, all these things by commutators, the analog uh, equation of motion for this in the RKKT model is just uh, an instance in which uh, these two variables here, yeah, I shouldn't have said that they commute here. They, they're equal to one, which is fine enough. Uh, so if the analog solution here in the RKKT model is that this commutator X a m a m is uh, proportional to a constant, in which case this just means that two of these uh, matrices uh, satisfy the Eisen version algebra. For example, if I take a zero to be some kind of position operator, and the a one to be some momentum operator, then uh, the Eisenberg algebra q commutator of q p equals i one is a solution of this equation motion. Um, so in other words, uh, what matrix theory does is that it replaces a continuous space uh, by matrices that satisfy some algebra via the equation of motion, which describes object in the space, such as strings. Um, but it doesn't stop there. There's also a uh, higher dimensional or lower dimensional solution to this equation of motion. And those are found by just extending this enzyme that I've done before for any matrices. So here, the commutator would be proportional to a constant matrix, which is fully anti-symmetric. And uh, in this case, typical solution of this uh, commutation relationship thing, takes the following form. So it is it takes the form of pairs of position and momentum operators, which commute with each other, uh, each satisfying this Eisenberg algebra, which I have uh, described before. And uh, there's only uh, one to five possible pairing of these different cubes. And interestingly enough, this corresponds, if, if, I take for, if I take for assumption that this first pairing is a string, then a second pairing would be, for example, a D3, a D3 brain. And then uh, adding another pairing would be a D5 brain. And then the final last pairing would be an AI brain. And those corresponds exactly to the type 2B uh, brain contents, uh, interestingly. And in fact, it's possible to show uh, that these brains have a gravitational interactions, um, which has the correct behavior. And to do that, what, what you can do is, for example, expand the IKKT motion and, and uh, the IKKT action and evaluate the one with effective action. You will find that these brains interact as they should in that to be string theory. Well, that's pretty nice. The IKKT model has strings. It has higher dimensional objects. Maybe it has more uh, interesting objects that are maybe time dependent because all these configurations that I've discussed here are time independent. They just, uh, well, they're static in space, but this is what I mean. Like they're time dependent, they evolve in space, but they're static. Like what if there is uh, some kind of structure um, that can describe, for example, that expands in space and can describe, for example, the universe. This is what we would like to find here. Um, well, maybe there are other solutions that can describe that. However, these solutions are very hard to find because you have to include all the primals and all these things. Um, however, there is ways to obtain so sensible solutions by modifying the IKKT model a bit by adding a master. Uh, for example, if I add this master in here, uh, which is Lawrence invariant, then uh, I can find solution of the IKKT equation in motion isotropic ones by imposing the sign that's here. So here my A0 matrix would have this tensor product structure so that it commutes with, no, it does not commute. Um, it would have this tensor product structure with the AIs. Uh, and then um, if you solve the equation in motion, you'll find that this A0 matrix and this A1 matrix satisfy some algebra, uh, which is shown at the bottom. And when m squared is greater than zero, this is exactly uh, the SU11 algebra. So I can solve this model exactly by imposing that these matrices uh, satisfy an algebra. And then to extract the time solution, or the time evolution of this solution, what I will do is, follow, is as follows. I will first diagonalize my A0 matrix in a way that uh, all the eigenvalues represent different values of time. 
And when I do this, uh, the AI matrices uh, will have some kind of Venn diagram structure because they don't commute with DA zero. And then what I will do to define time is that I will find I will define a sum matrix um, of A0, which runs along the diagonal. Uh, and then time of, uh, in, in here I should also mention that the time eigenvalues are ordered chronologically. So what will happen is if I move this sum matrix along the diagonal, then time will involve. Uh, if I define time as being an average of the eigenvalue of this matrix. Um, and then associated, if I study the structure of this matrix along the, the evolution in the AI direction, uh, then I should be able to study how, spine, how, how time evolves in this model. And specifically for the SU11 algebra, uh, the the sum the sum matrices matrices take the following form. Here, the SU11 algebra, you have to remember that it uh, it is described by well, you have to find that you have to first choose a representation. There's many. There's the discrete series representation. Uh, here, what I will use is the primary series um, representation. And in this representation, the sum matrices uh, of the past slide uh, they take the following form. So, so the A1 matrices will will take this form. Well where n here is um, is associated to my time parameter. Uh, and then the AI matrices will take uh, this following form. Uh, it, it's, so in other words, it's going to be 0 everywhere except at the first off diagonal elements. And this is just from the structure of rising and lowering operators in this representation. Um, and here, epsilon is either zero or, or half. I will pick it to Z zero in this case, just for simplicity. And uh, rho is just a non-negative number, which specifies a representation of this, uh, a special case of this uh, PUSR. Um, so according to the definition of time, be uh, of time that I had before, the time parameter in this model is just, which is the average of the eigenvalues here is just mn. So time will increase as I increase n, uh, which is the location of my sum matrices of the diagonal. Um, and then I can compute what's called an extent of space parameter, which describes the extent of objects in my space as a function of time. So some kind of root mean square distribution of the objects in, uh, as a function of time. And this extent of space parameter uh, behaves a little bit like a scale factor, as, we, as we'll see uh, soon. Uh, so if I compute this extent of space parameter using this uh, sum matrix that I defined here, I find that it takes this quantity. And then if now if I think the m goes to zero limit, I obtain some kind of continuum limit. Um, uh, and in this case, uh, this extent of space parameter can be written in in in, in terms of a physical time, um, which is just the the time that I have. Um, defined before, and it takes the following form. Um, describe the following time evolution as you see in this figure. And interestingly enough, this extended space parameter, which I told you that uh, should should describe some kind of scale, uh, uh, scale factor, also satisfies a very sensible uh, Friedman equation, which you see here. In fact, it would just be the Friedman equation of a cosmology with negative radiation and uh, positive curvature. So that's pretty nice. What I've told you is that using this IKKT model, and if I introduce a mass term, then I can, I can obtain something that looks like a cosmology, which is pretty nice. I didn't have to use GR at all. It just follows from the structure of these matrices. However, uh, introducing this mass term here is a bit problematic. Uh, because as you see, as you see earlier from the way that uh, the IKKT model follows from type to be string theory, if I add a mass term, this would be equivalent to adding a mass term in string theory, which would violate conformal invariance. Um, so this is something that's not very natural to do here. Um, in the remaining portion of the talk, uh, I what I will try to do is show that if you compactify. Um, the IKKT model and break supersymmetry, then effectively 
uh, the AKKT model, which originally does not have a master, which is important to preserve conformal symmetry in uh, string dual string theory. Uh, well, if I compactify and I break conformal uh, supersymmetry, then I get an effective master um, in this theory, which can lead to solutions that um, I've shown here. But furthermore, that also lead to symmetry breaking, which is very important. See, the IKKT model is a model which has SO19 symmetry. But uh, our universe should have SO1, 3, cross O6, uh, where uh, the SO1, 4 set. Uh, describes our the uh, well the large part of the universe and then the six remaining dimension remains small as should be in string theory. Um, so without further ado, let's go to the solutions. So as I've said, I'll try to compactify the KKT model, and uh, to do this, I will have to use a technique which is not often very well known because you don't need any quantum field theory. See, in quantum field theory, if you want to compactify, you have your continuous parameters. And then I can just compactify these continuous parameters, say that they are contained within a finite interval. And then this imposes a contradiction uh, in, 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 in the limit where this, con this interval is very small, then I obtain uh, a dimensionally reduced theory. But here my KKT model does not any have any of these free parameters. So I have to be a little bit more crafty. Um, so to compactify, I have to make the point observation. Um, a compact space, like for example, a torus, uh, can be viewed as a space with this constraint within a finite interval, or it can be also with, peri and with periodic dimensions. But it can also be viewed as the universal cover of that interval, which means that this interval repeats an infinite amount of time on each time. And this is actually something that can be re reproduced in the IKKT model, since it's a model of target space. Um, so here, what I will assume is that, is that is there exists a fundamental region in the IKKT model, which is confined between uh, um, t equals 1 and, well, here, the, this would be x for space. Uh, let, let's face it. I will uh, assume that there is a, a region between uh, So I'm having audio issues. My headset just uh, stopped functioning. So, okay. Uh, can you still hear me? Uh, we can. We we lost you uh, for uh, for a few seconds, a half a minute maybe, but uh, we can hear you now again. The audio issues I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. But now we hear you. Um, okay. Can you talk, uh, Tobias? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, again. You, you, yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay, I hear you. Maybe we'll get echoes later on, along in the talk if there's questions. I'm very sorry about that. I, I'm having so, uh, issues with my headphones. No worries. Yeah, we will. We'll try. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So let's continue. Uh, so as I was trying to tell you, I will use what's called the method of images, which means that I will take a fundamental region which is confined between. Uh, x and 2 pi l, which is the radius of compactification, and I will duplicate it. I will assume that this uh, region can be duplicated along each side, um, each physical direction around the directions that are compacted fine. And to do this, I will impose the following constraint on my matrix model. I will uh, assume that there exists a uh, translation operator, which I call u, that translate uh, my fundamental region from uh, one region to the other. And then if I want my uh, matrix to be compact, to have six compact dimensions, uh, six spatial dimensions that are compactify, what I will do is that is that I will assume that along the uh, directions that are compactify, uh, these uh, directions will, will be shifted by an amount to L in, as to describe some kind of winding in my theory. And that in the other directions, 
uh, in the AU directions, but right now I'm going back, uh, I will just go back to the same configuration. Uh, and then furthermore, to break supersymmetry, I will assume that uh, this fermionic matrix, matrix here will pick up a minus sign, just like you would have, for example, in a thermal field theory, uh, uh, which here will break supersymmetry. So if I impose these constraints conditions, uh, my matrices will uh, take the following block toplets form. Here, a block toplets matrix would be a matrix in which all the diagonal elements are the same, and the, uh, the other of diagonal element are also the same along the diagonals. Uh, and the way you should view these block toplet matrices is, uh, is that the uh, diagonal elements, the diagonal blocks describe my fundamental region, uh, which are, for example, in the uh, compact dimension shifted as you go down the diagonal. And the up diagonal elements, the up diagonal blocks describe interaction between fundamental regions, which you can see in, in the following figure. And action-wise, what it will do to impose this constraint is that for each uh, uh, dimension that you compactify, uh, you will recover a free parameter in, in your model. So if I compactify six dimension, I actually recover one free parameter, six free dimension. So um, my IKKT model, what will happen once I compactify is that it will become equivalent uh, to a Euclidean Lyapunov theory in six dimensions where uh, the mode expansion of this theory is exactly the IKKT, the compact uh, IKKT model where I've substituted the compact matrices. Uh, so just using this mode expansion here. So for example, the, the zero mode of this mode expansion would describe uh, the fundamental region. And then the, uh, the, the non-zero mode would here uh, corresponds to interaction between fundamental regions. And then uh, you can see that this works. Like for example, if I go to the decompactification limit, uh, I should recover the IKKT model. And this is what happens. Uh, if I expand this mode expansion, then the first term that you obtain here is just the IKKT model. And then you have uh, winding terms plus interactions. But in the uh, L goes to infinity limit, which is the, the decompactification limit, then these modes here becomes very heavy, uh, which means that the interactions become can become neglected and I recover the IKKT action that I started with. However, without the fermions because I've broken supersymmetry. So what I will recover it when I break supersymmetry uh, in the decompactification limit is just the bosonic IKKT model. And then, uh, you know, if, if I go to the compactification limit, I should expect that there are corrections to this model that should appear. And this is what I will evaluate next, and that will give me this master that I'm talking about. Uh, so remember here, uh, the uh, fundamental region describes, uh, are described by the zero mode. So what I should obtain here is an effective description of the zero modes as I change the radius. And this case can be done by using a, a Wilsonian effective action. Right? Uh, just to remind you of what a, a Wilsonian effective action is, if you had a field theory and you wanted to uh, find an effective description of, of the of, uh, of the, 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 the long modes in this theory, then what I could do is uh, take this theory, take the path integral, and split the two kind of modes, the UV modes from the IR modes, and then integrate out the IR modes above a cutoff in order to obtain what this effective action is described here. So here, what I can do in the IKKT model is exactly the same thing, but for the zero modes. I will start with the compact IKKT action, and then I will integrate out all the non-zero modes, so all the interactions between the fundamental regions, in order to obtain an action uh, which depends only on the zero modes, an effective action which depends only on the zero modes, uh, and where all the uh, interactions have been integrated out. 
this will give me an effective description of the non-compact uh, uh, degrees of freedom right here. So once I have this expression, then the only thing that, that's left to do is just to evaluate it using perturbative uh, technique. So what I will do is uh, just expand the action as a, the zero mode term and then the, the quadratic term in the interactions terms. And then once I do this, I obtain this following expression. The effective action is just the uh, IKKT action, the bosonic IKKT action, plus a constant term, which I will neglect because it's non-dynamical. And then uh, all the interesting part come, really comes from this term here, which is uh, which uh, involve an expectation value with respect to the, the quadratic terms in my yang mills theory. And if I evaluate this to um, second order perturbation theory, what I will obtain as what I would what I obtain as a first order corrections is these mass terms here, uh, which break uh, the SO10 symmetry of this Euclidean IKKT model to SO4 times SO6. Uh, here, these terms are are expressed in terms of um, uh, of series, uh, which are called Epstein series, which are just remnants of the propagators and. Uh, in the uh, yang mills theory. And it are, they're inversely proportional to the, 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 compact, the compactification radius. Um, moreover, uh, this F, SF1 here is greater than SB1. So these, these quantities here that have the final are always gonna be positive. The mass terms are always gonna be positive. Um, these mass terms have some interesting properties. Uh, well, first, they're not e equal to each other, which leads to the symmetry breaking that I that I explained. And then the the, the, the scale as uh, the compactification length, uh, the inverse of the compactification length. So I, in the limit where I decompactify my, my theory, I obtain, as I should, the bosonic IKKT model, uh, which is to be expected. Uh, but furthermore, uh, Super, the breaking of supersymmetry seems to play a very important role in obtaining these mass terms. If I restore supersymmetry, and this is by uh, giving periodic boundary conditions to the fermions, then you, you'll see that, uh, that these two quantities, these two sum will be equal, so the term disappears. Um, and so in order to obtain this effective description where I have an effective mass term, it seems that supersymmetry is very important to preserve. Um, then a final fact, Final interesting fact here, I've worked in Lorentz signature, uh, but if I uh, rick rotate my time uh, back to Lorentzian sp space, then the space time as SO1 tree cross SO6 symmetry. Um, so this is pretty interesting. It has the correct symmetry that our space time should have. Um, so maybe there are interesting cosmological solution of this model which should be explored that looks a little bit like we had before, but in which a uh, sixth dimension stays small. Uh, that would be very interesting to explore. Um, that's all I had to say for today. So in summary, um, uh, cosmology, it seems like cosmology um, needs non perturbative effects in order to explain what happens near the Big Bang. Uh, the IKKT model is a promising non perturbative description. Uh, if I add a mass term to this model, which is non-physical a priori, uh, then I obtain an interesting cosmological solution. Um, however, you can also obtain a mass term by compactifying the theory and breaking supersymmetry. If you compactify uh, six dimensions in the Lorentz, in the Euclidean IKKT model, uh, then the SO10 symmetry is broken to SO4 across SO6. And if I would rotate, then I obtain a, a then a space time that has the correct symmetry. So it would be very interesting to explore a cosmological solution of this model. So that's it. Thank you for listening and I am open to questions. Okay, yeah. Thanks a lot for this great talk.